Welcome back to Nerd Alert, brought to you by the Sony Ericsson Xperia Play 4G. I am Jeff Rubin, and every holiday season, literally trillions of people visit New York City. But where are the places to go for people that don't like going places? Today, we are going to take a look at the nerdy underground of New York, including Barcade, the only bar you can go to to avoid social interaction. We are also going to be taking a look at the theater. One of Broadway's hottest tickets is Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, but what about a show for people that actually like comic books? Comic Book Club at the People's Improv Theater is a weekly talk show where people argue about comic books. We'll find out if arguing about them on stage is more fun than arguing about them over the internet. And if you want to go to a store with a wall of Super Nintendo games but don't have access to a time machine, you have to go to Video Games New York. They have everything from games your mom wouldn't buy you as a kid to games you cannot afford now. Let's head over and check it out. Most video game retailers currently have maybe a Call of Duty sign in the window, maybe something with Skyrim. What does Video Games New York have? Joystick spare parts organized by size. And the best part, we're not even inside yet. I am here with Julio, the owner of Video Games New York. Julio, it seems like you guys have everything here. Right behind us, there's a Lynx, there's a CDI. Do you guys have 32X? Yeah, we do. I was gonna ask if you have a Virtual Boy. Not only do you have a Virtual Boy, right oh, behind you, there's the Virtual Boy promotional we stand. Do. Of all these systems that you have in the store, which is the most popular? What are people coming in and buying games for? You know, it goes by period. In this moment, Nintendo 64. Interesting. Last year, probably Super Nintendo. Before that, original Nintendo. It do you not... anticipate it becomes PlayStation 2 in a few years? It will. What is this thing? Like, if you turn it on, does it combine all three games into one super the best game ever? How do you actually price these games? Because I was looking around, I noticed the average Super Nintendo game is, let's say, it's about $20 in this store, or something like that. No, no, no it's lower? No, no. I would say the average is probably like around 10 bucks. So when I see something that's higher than 10 bucks, like Pilot Wings is $25, is that the market recognizing that Pilot Wings is an above average game? Sometimes yes, sometimes not. I mean, you have to consider the way Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can't compete. We have no interest to compete with, you know, an eBay store or a guy in Montana. But there are certain games that they, it really, it's pretty much impossible to keep them in stock. So, like what's an example of one of those? Oh, easily. Mario Kart for 64. Mario Kart 64 is hard to find? It's not hard to find. It's hard to find. It's hard, it's, it's it's hard to keep it in stock. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that is a game that uh, is definitely more expensive than market price. And it's still, we can't keep it in stock. Beat it. Beat it. Beat it. This one sucks. Beat it. What is the most money a single person has ever spent after coming into this store? I remember people spending a few thousands. And I'll tell you the most money. Is that like on 500 Nintendo games? Or are they buying a few things that are very expensive? You know what? Uh, it's a mix. Uh, sometimes people really buy an insane amount of games. People come and buy maybe, you know, 80 games or 70 games. Or, you know, so it just, they really and they're really... just like, see you next year. If any sort of I Am Legend situation ever actually breaks out in Manhattan, this is where I want to be. Before we started talking, I asked you what the most expensive thing in the store was, and you said it's not actually in the store, and you needed 15 sure. minutes to run down to the bank. You got it out for us, which I really appreciate. Can we right, talk about that? What, Absolutely. What, what is that? Uh, this, uh, you know, this is the World Championship 1990 Nintendo. This is the 1990 Nintendo World Championship cartridge. cartridge. This is the one that they use uh, for this famous you know, World Championship. Can we, can we see it? Absolutely. I think this is sort of the holy grail of video game collecting. It is. It's always been. I mean, you know, if you want it, that's the gold version of the same game that is even more rare. But it's the same game. So this was a prize that someone won at the Nintendo Correct. World Champion? How did you come into owning it? <sighs> Circumstances. The guy was one of our customers. Uh, he was uh, pretty much immediately after the Katrina. And his house was in New Orleans. And he had to go to New Orleans back, uh, try to save the cartridge from the safe. Wow. And he said, I don't want to go through this uh, another time. I want to sell it. I want to sell it to someone that is going to keep it, uh, that I know you guys are not going to sell it. Uh, How do you price you, something like this? There's only so don't. many of them. You don't, because uh, in reality, the price market, for now, from my point of view, and it's personal, it's really low. If you sell it correctly, because you know it's warranty, you know they, you, they know exactly where it comes from. and it, You can probably sell now between uh, 12 and 15, 16, 17 maybe. Thousand uh, dollars in dollars, thousand dollars. Yes, not in like rupees no, or no, gold no, coins. No, no. Try to think that you know the number one of Superman in comics is about a right. million dollar. Mm -hmm. What is going to happen 20, 30 years from now? It's 15, 17, 20 thousand sounds very low to me. This is like a long term investment, and you know, it's part of uh, 
our museum something that we don't want to sell. Move in, I want to see if we can get a shot of this. This is Cutthroat Island for the Game Gear. This is like a failure sandwich. And the most incredible part is it still costs twice as much as the game next week. That's how bad Game Gear games got. This is a development kit. <sighs> oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, okay. This is like fifty thousand dollars with the PlayStation Two. I'm holding. This is a. The, that's how they, you know, they create game for PS2. So this is the kind of thing. Like, if you're even the biggest video game fan, you just don't see this stuff in stores. No. You never have access to something no, like this. You don't. Video games are a piece of American culture. So I make a point for our store to have some of this stuff because this makes the difference between a retail store and a cultural space. We want to keep some of that historical value yeah. of what video games have in the United States. It's incredible because all this stuff is on display. So it's, it's like a museum, but also you can buy the things if you really like that's, them. That's exactly the concept of the store. Well, thank you so much for uh, having You're us welcome. at the store. Let's go see a show. This is the last issue, 52 weeks, 52 issues. Did it come together? Did you like it? It's Was hurt. it worth it? No. Nope. Comic Book Club is a weekly talk show where people discuss the latest comic books on stage. I am here with the host of Comic Book Club, Alex Zalbin. Thanks for being here, Alex. Hey, thanks for having me, Jeff. Now, you guys have had a lot of exciting guests on the show. You had Bill Willingham, who created Fables. You had Andrew WK, who created everything. Who have been some of your favorite guests? Um, we've had uh, so many amazing guests on the show. We've been doing it for almost five years at this point. Uh, Brian Michael Bendis, who's the author of Ultimate Spider-Man, currently writing all of the Avengers books. We've also had people like uh, Bill Hader and Seth Meyers from Saturday Night Live. Kevin Conroy, voice of Batman on oh, Batman man. the Animated Series and literally every other Batman thing ever. Yeah, he's still doing the voice in Arkham City. He is, exactly. Did he do the Batman voice for you guys? He did. That was, people always ask us, what's our number one favorite thing for the show? Him coming out and saying, I am vengeance. Oh. I am the knight That's on awesome. stage. Right. I just wanted to point out that, you know, new Fantastic Four and there's six people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, now, is Galactus the villain, or is he part of the team? Because if, if you have Galactus on the team, the rest of the guys can kind of stay home. <laughs> yeah. Do you read everything that comes out every week? Oh, I try not to. But yeah, I do. I mean, I come home from the comic book store with a stack pretty much this big, and every week I say, no, this is my last week. I'm, I'm just a couple next week. It's are, like drugs. Are you ever like, oh my god, I cannot believe I have to read all these comic books before this week's show? Oh, yeah. I always hate telling people that, but there are times when you just get sick and tired of saying, oh, I have to read all these superhero comic books at home. When are I going to find the time? What kind of people come to the show? The worst people. <laughs> no, great people. Uh, you know, Do you have like hecklers and they're like, Spider-Man sucks? Absolutely. That's actually one of my favorite parts about the show is the fans can't help but shout out during oh, the show. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Because I mean, you're arguing about comic books. Exactly. And, and these are people, I'm assuming, who have their own opinions on comic books. Yeah, and we try to make it a show. I mean, it's not people screaming at each other for a solid hour, but there are people in the audience, they contribute, they yell out stuff. Uh, if we don't know a fact, they correct us. I really love this book, and I just love when any time the little girl, she has the coolest superpower, she has a superpower that's kind of similar to my superpower. It's like, <laughs> he, she, Freaks out, gets super strong, and then is instantly tired. I'm like the same way, but with just like small activities. <laughs> you guys have a five year anniversary come up. You've been doing the show since 2007. Have you seen changes in the comic book industry just since you've started doing the show? Absolutely. The biggest one I would say is when we started off the show, myself and the two other hosts, Pete and Justin, sort of sussed each other out privately, saw that we, you know, had uh, comic book bags and kind of felt like, okay, this is it, we're coming out on stage as comic book geeks, and now it's kind of cool to be a comic book geek. Yeah. And we did that. This is, but in the first uh, couple of weeks of doing the show, we got a write-up in the New York Times from the guy who was the comic book fan there saying, wow, there's a live show about comic books, and we talked to him about it, and he said, yeah, I'm always trying to push through stories, always trying to get stuff in. And now there's comic book stories in the New York Times and the mainstream press all the time. So the show is Comic Book Club weekly every Tuesday here at the People's Improv Theater here in the Flatiron District. Thanks so much for uh, being on Nerd Alert, Alex. Thank you for having me. Let's head to Barcade. We are at Barcade in Brooklyn, where drinking and playing Donkey Kong isn't just socially acceptable, it's actually encouraged. This is Paul, the owner of Barcade. Paul, this is an incredible collection of games you have here, obviously put together by someone who knows arcade games. How do you decide which games to get? Uh, well, my partners and I kind of have a uh, never-ending list uh, of games that we're always looking for, and uh, we kind of pull from that list and rotate in and out, uh, trying to balance uh, some really you know, more popular ones of the era and some rarities and more kind of unusual titles. Uh, but everything is really f mostly from 
the golden period of games, which is like 1979, 1984. Would you ever consider having a second bar that has maybe some 90s games? You know, you get T2, the arcade machine. Yeah, well, we do throw a few 90s titles in. I mean, we, we mostly, 90% of what we do is from those like five years. But then like we have Smash TV here, with it, which is 1990. So we sprinkle a few of those in. Why stick to the early 80s Golden Age games? Well, when you uh, talk to anyone who's into classic arcade games and people who collect games, like this is like the period of games where um, obviously they were at their most popular. Arcades were like a big deal back then, uh, but games are more creative. Um, this is before really fighting games and like first person shooters took over. Um, and really at, at that point, every game in the arcade was like a fighting game. Right, right. right. But that, these games like are all you know, hard to describe and hard to really understand. Satan's Hollow. This looks like the haunted game someone might get stuck in in the video game episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark? What is the most popular game in the bar? Uh, most popular games kind of vary from night to night. Miss Pac-Man and Galaga, Tetris are really popular. The classics. Uh, yeah, Rampage is really popular because you know, three people can play together and destroy. Like, yeah, fun while you're drinking yeah, too. Destroy Midwestern US, so. Not Donkey Kong? Donkey Kong's pretty popular, but we have a lot of kind of really serious Donkey Kong players who come in, put a quarter in, and they're playing for five hours. Right, so. like uh, Hank Shen, who set the record for Donkey Kong. Yeah, yeah briefly, what, he practiced here. We talked to him about yeah, that. Yeah, he plays here a lot, uh, and really the nights when he's here, we don't pull many quarters out of the game at the end of the night. Look at this. They have tables in between the machines so you can put your drink down while you're playing the game. Think about how great that is. I used to need friends. Arcades are kind of notorious for just having like sticky buttons here and there, but these games are all very well maintained. How do you do that in a bar environment? I'm glad you think so. You should read some of our Yelp reviews. I think the games here are more well maintained than your average pizza parlor. Well, we try to take uh, good care of them and we do a lot of our own maintenance. You know, a lot of times in like a pizza place or whatever, they're partnering with a, a vending company, so they have to wait for them to come out to make any repairs to a joystick. They maybe even can't even get into the machine. So we own all our own games, so we're constantly trying to maintain them. Plus, we try to stay up on it. I mean, it's one thing to have a game in an arcade that people are going to be playing and banging on it. We're serving beer here and a lot of it. Thanks so much for letting us come by, Paul. No problem. Thank Marquette you. Mark Williamsburg, check it out. That's it for this episode of Nerd Alert. If you've made it this far into the video, there's a pretty good chance you'll also enjoy my podcast, The Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show, where I interview nerd heroes like the guy that created Settlers of Catan and a Magic the Gathering champion. Nerd Alert will return as a series of specials. And even though we're not doing the show weekly anymore, I'm still going to say, here is CGY, our bad special effects of the week. Later, losers. Okay, everybody hold their positions. Everybody stay right where you are, all right? Don't move. Yeah.